And then uh, we will have the second uh, speaker, uh, and it's a privilege for me to introduce uh, Barbara Prinsack, who is a professor at the De Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna. Uh, Barbara's work explores the social, regulatory and ethical dimensions of biomedicine and bioscience, uh, with a particular focus on personalized medicine, citizen participation, and the role of solidarity in medicine and healthcare. And she has addressed uh, these issues in uh, numerous publications, including her book on personalized medicine, Empowered Patients in the 21st Century, and also in another very interesting book, Solidarity in Medicine and Beyond. Barbara is also a member of uh, a number of procedures committees, including the Austrian National Bioethics Committee and the European Group on Ethics in Science and New Technologies, which is advising the European Commission. And uh, she has also chaired the European Science Foundation's forward look on personalized medicine for the European citizen. So today she will talk about the role of patient participation in personalized medicine, and it's so great to have you here, and we're looking very much forward to your presentation, Barbara. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Meta. Um, I hope that um, everyone can now see my slides. Um, thanks also very much for having me and a special thank you to uh, Bettina for a really marvelous talk. Um, it will be very difficult to now uh, speak after Bettina um, because uh, some of the, the, the points that I was going to emphasize are, are points that Bettina made. Um, but let me let, let me tell you what, what I've been tasked with in particular, which is also to trouble this notion of participation and empowerment a little bit. So I would like to start with outlining what it is, and I will touch upon many points that Bettina already mentioned, and then I will say something about what, um, based on our research and activities, so um, as that there are a lot of policy papers and a lot of conferences that emphasize that patients should be in the center of personalized medicine. And although everyone would probably agree with that, the million dollar question is, of course, what does it mean and how do we um, how do we implement that? Um, here I um, put on the slide the um, the, the report of the European Science Foundation's forward look on personalized medicine that's almost a decade old now that Mette was very kind to mention. And, and there we try to outline um, what meaningful participation could mean. But I think in a first instance, it's really important to also um, look at where participation in personalized medicine um, comes in. And one very, very obvious place where it comes in is what um, what scholars have called datafication. So datafication sounds like a very fancy word that means everything and nothing. But if we look at look at it a little bit more deeply, we see that um, things that people have been doing all the time um, are now th that people used to do without these uh, data being captured um, with this information being captured uh, in terms of data, these things are now captured in data. So asking um, for support when we need, um, when we are sick, running, moving, eating, all of those things, of course, people have been doing all along, but the difference, and this is the, this is the core of the meaning of datafication, these things that, that were very private, and, and, and Bettina has already meant, highlighted the notion and the importance of privacy. Those things used to be private and now they're very often captured in terms of data because we are collecting them on our um, personal devices, we're collecting them on our phones, so we're collecting them. Um, they are being collected by remote sensing, by, um, by in increasing public archives, um, commercial activities and so on and so on. And in this context, some of us are talking about the end of uh, um, structural privacy in the sense that it's, it's a term that comes from uh, the legal scholar Harry Serden, um, in the sense that um, people's privacy is, is, is um, uh, decreasing, not so much because of any nefarious person um, who is now uh, depriving people of the privacy or infringing uh, personal freedoms, but simply because of, because of how much data is now being captured. So what, what is the implication of that? And I think that's a very important background 
um, to uh, thinking participation in terms of personalized medicine and healthcare more broadly, that all data nowadays are health data. So as you can see here on, on the right side of the slide, this is a, a slide that comes from um, a paper that um, colleagues um, uh, in bioinformatics in Harvard published in 2014. Um, and they said that these types of information should be utilized and, and, and mined and analyzed in order to create really personalized healthcare. And as you can see here, even if you, if I'm not expecting you to read everything, of course, there are lots of um, um, types of information that have nothing to do with health at first sight. Police records, social media postings, um, insurance data and so on. So because we can link so much information nowadays, even the most innocuous data can disclose something about our health. So this is one thing to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind, and of course I'm not telling you anything new here, is that data capture, when we capture data about our lives, our bodies, they're not merely representing who we are, but they're creating new practices. So one thing from uh, one quote of a young man um, from my book um, on personalized and data, data rich medicine is that he said he uses an activity tracker and the activity tracker, when, the, when it tells him to, um, that he hasn't reached his daily goal in terms of his uh, fuel points, then he would still go for another walk. So um, capturing data, tracking ourselves, doesn't only represent who we are, but it also changes what we actually do. And this, um, this data curation at the level of individuals is not a trivial point, um, and it is not restricted only to personalized medicine. Um, uh, this is a quote from Mark Britnell, the second one here on the slide. Um, that um, where he predicted in his 2015 book uh, in search of the perfect healthcare system that activated patients as he calls it will become more and more important um, also for the sustainability of healthcare systems more broadly so the idea that patients um, curate and disclose information about themselves which is already um, a, a common need in the context of um, the personalized and precision medicine, data-rich practices, this um, is, is becoming ever more important in healthcare more broadly. So now to the key point um, that, that I wanted to make here. Um, well, it, it, this, this, this process of datafication and digitization leaves no part of our lives untouched. So broader aspects of patients' lives are now open to um, to, to analysis also for um, health and um, medical um, decision making. Um, but what does it mean for empowerment? So that there, there was a time when a lot of the reports, especially about personalized medicine and precision medicine, just celebrated the fact that patients contribute data and contribute information as empowerment as such. But I think we need a much, much more nuanced view. And, and again, Bettina um, already highlighted some of those aspects. So um, the, the data orientation that personalized medicine and precision medicine have is positive for the empowerment of some groups of patients, is not so positive for others and also in different aspects. And a, a brief look at the history of personalization will already show um, some of these dynamics. So as, as many people, um, patients and um, clinicians remind us, um, if we think of personalization as a practice, not as a concept, but as a practice, then personalization is of course as old as medicine, really. So the, 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 the archetypical country doctor that you can see here on the left hand of the slide um, from uh, John Berger's famous book, practiced personalized medicine. So he knew his patients, he knew their, their circumstances, their family circumstances, their histories, and so on. Um, and in this co context of the country doctor, um, the use of evidence was, of course, very different from evidence that we use for personalization today. When the country doctor died or when he retired, the, all this information, all this knowledge was gone. But it was a very um, direct and also narrative 
um, way of relating to patients and also the patient um, because uh, conversations were such an important diagnostic tool, the patient was um, the voice of her disease almost. So diagnosis and treatment decisions were made on the basis of speaking to the patient, touching the patient and so on. This, this changed in the aftermath of the um, Human Genome Project when personalization was becoming more and more molecular and in particular genetic. So Adam Hedgeco's um, iconic book from 2004 illustrates that in, the, in, the, in these years, um, the first years after the Human Genome Project, um, personalization, personalized medicine was almost um, synonymous with matching drug treatments to, um, to, to, to genetic markers of groups. And then, and again, Irene Norstadt has already mentioned that as well, um, the type of precision medicine that um, is practiced or envisioned um, nowadays is much broader in that it includes multi-omics, it includes systemic approaches, um, and it includes uh, different, not only molecular, but other data, increasingly also lifestyle data. And what does this mean for patients? It means that in, on the one hand, they can bring in their own voice more because of more wider aspects of their lives, um, of, of preferences also, as Bettina mentioned, if, they are, if these things are seen as important, if they're recognized as important, they are included increasingly in, in, in clinical decision making, patients um, can can bring in their own voice again. So it's not just their, their, their um, genes and their, their genomic profiles that speak for them. But at the same time, and this is uh, something that my colleagues um, Henrik Vogt and, 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 and others are emphasizing, it is also a particular techno-scientific version of holism. So Precision medicine is more holistic, draws more strongly on systemic approaches, but it is also almost that it cuts apart humans uh, and then puts them back together in terms of data points. And whereas there are huge um, 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 new um, opportunities in there, something also gets lost. And what what is gets what what gets lost sometimes is the is this the stuff, you know, the, the information, the data that are not um, that are not uh, routinely captured, that that might be messy, that are not structured, and the conversations. So lots of people um, say that they actually want to be they want to be talked to, um, and they want to be in a conversation. They want to be asked about their own preferences, about their own experience. And um, Bettina's notion of the patient expert um, captures that very well. So a lot of the patient expertise is, is in unstructured narrative data that yet, yet is very, very important. So what does this mean? I'll try to create a bit of a more systematic typology here. Um, we, there are at least four different types of empowerment at play um, in personalized medicine and in the wider healthcare system. And it's important to keep those apart because if we if we lump everything together as empowerment and celebrate it, then a, a lot of the, the a lot of, of, of the possibilities of, um, of 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 true genuine deep empowerment get lost, and a lot of the problems that Bettina also outlined will not be solved. So the first type of empowerment is what what I call individualistic empowerment. Um, it's individualistic in the sense that it is it is basically um, the attempt to broaden um, access and, and the market choice of patients. So this is very much couched in, in the idea that the patient is a market consumer. And this is, it, it sounds maybe more negative than I mean it. It captures an important aspect of what goes on in healthcare, but, but there's more to it. A different type of uh, patient empowerment is what I call instrumental empowerment. And these are, this is very often invited participation. So where some, uh, where for example, healthcare provision is supposed to be improved according to specific parameters um, and patients' voices are, are invited in and are being collected and analyzed to improve this particular healthcare um, uh, service. Uh, and here, um, the, 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 
the, the voice of the patient, whatever the patient brings in, serves an, a different an, an, a different ultimate goal. Um, this is again not a negative thing, but it means that um, broadening the range of voices that come to the table, um, broadening the range of patients that have that, that are being heard on something, um, whose uh, information and expertise is being captured, is not an end in itself. And this is, of course, different in what, what I call democratic empowerment. I have here on this slide the image of uh, a citizen's jury, which, which illustrates the idea that underpins it. The idea is that, I mean, citizen juries don't exist because professional jurors aren't good enough. Um, but citizen juries exist because there's the view that broadening the range of people, the range of voices that are being heard on a specific topic, that are being heard when making a decision, has a value in itself. And democratic empowerment in personalized medicine is represented, for example, in the All of Us initiative in the US, is in, represented in many precision and personalized medicine initiatives all over Europe that pay specific attention to including especially people who are not routinely heard. Also, um, patients who, are, who live with rare diseases, and patients who are underserved, and so on. And this is very closely related to the fourth type of empowerment, which I call emancipatory empowerment, very closely linked to um, women's rights, uh, civil rights movements, um, where one of the purposes is also to um, to liberate uh, either knowledge or people from oppression is a big word, but from maybe the domination of, of some hegemonic knowledge. And when it comes to underserved population, it's certainly a very relevant form of empowerment that especially when we recruit for research for personalized medicine, we have to keep in mind. I'm coming to the end. Um, it is very important when we talk about empowerment in personalized medicine to keep in mind that a lot of the empowerment, and especially by entities who had the strongest rhetoric of participation on empowerment, has empowered those who were already privileged. So um, the company that you can see here on the slide that had a very, very strong empowerment rhetoric um, was empowering mostly people who already had high incomes, who lived in rich parts of the world um, and who already had a say. So really true and deep empowerment is empowerment that also increases the options to have a say, to be heard, and the, 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 the options to act for those who are not necessarily privileged. And this is uh, the, the, the scenario which, which, uh, with which I would like to end. Um, if we do not increase meaningful participation in personalized medicine, of which good access to basic healthcare is a precondition, if we don't do that, then we might move towards a scenario where we have what I call the rise of automated medicine. So those who have enough money and social capital will be able to pay for concierge medicine, um, you know, where the doctor comes to your house, which is also very COVID friendly, of course, uh, because it's very, um, it, 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 uh, it minimizes the contact and, and waiting with other people in the room. So the patient comes to your house, you get high touch medicine, you get high high tech medicine, you get a lot of your omics analyzed and you have the human power for interpretation, which is of course always the bottleneck, like the expensive bottleneck nowadays in, in precision medicine is not the creation of data, it's interpretation. So that might be available for those who can pay out of pocket, whereas many of the others have what, what's what I call automated medicine, where problems that are not serious and that are not urgent will increasingly be analyzed um, digitally uh, in an automated way, maybe even online. And this is certainly a scenario that we do not want to that, that fewer and fewer people have access to humans, which are also an important part of personalized medicine. And I conclude with saying um, what we should do, outlining what we should do in order to um, approach more meaningful interpretation, uh, meaningful participation. Um, well, we need to support initiatives that don't just take data from people without people having any say about what happens with the data, but meaningful agency of people. So ask patients what, how they want the data to be used. 
how they want, who they, 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 they want the data to help and so on. We also need to always consider the systemic effects of empowerment. So when so one group of patients is being heard, when healthcare services change, when research uses particular data sets, what happens with the rest of the system? If, does, does, does our focus on some types of patients crowd out our get, view of the others? And as I already said, universal and equitable access to healthcare might not have much to do with personalized medicine at first sight, but it's the root of meaningful participation in healthcare and in personalized medicine. And of course, as, you all, as we all know, um, health outcomes are shaped only to a limited extent by the healthcare system and by personalization. So we need to really also draw attention to um, other areas of living that have an impact on people's health and well-being. And with that, I'll stop. And apologies for the for the technological glitch, but I hope you could see the, the rest of the slides. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>